What's up, everybody? Welcome back to uh, an AFCON diary uh, brought to you by www.africasacountry.com. Uh, we will be having coverage of the AFCON there, so you can go check that out. Um, today is day seven. I can't believe we've already been here for seven whole days. It's already been a week. It's uh, flown by, and at the same time, it's been sometimes it's felt like a month. Um, today we had three matches, as per. We had Cameroon versus Senegal. We had Cape Verde versus Mozambique, and we had Guinea versus the Gambia. Not in that order, but that's the order I'm going to I'm gonna talk about those matches in. So we're going to start with Cameroon and Senegal, because I think, obviously, those are two of the biggest sides uh, on the continent, and I think it's the match that had the most interest. Senegal come into this match, they make one change. Nyakate out for Abdou Diallo at set center half, like for like. Cameroon come into this match. Magri, who was playing on the right wing, comes into... Uh, his true target man position. It was kind of confusing why he was on the right wing in the first match. Uh, and Gamadou comes in on the right wing. Carl Toko can be on the bench. Uh, Ivan Neyu in f uh, for Olivier Ncham. And Enzo Chato for Harold Mukudi. Uh, some of those, you know, like Castellato was at right back. They moved him back into his, again, true position, center half. And they moved Enzo Chato at right and Mukudi out. So um, just, just let's have a preliminary discussion. When you see that, you know, four or five changes versus one change. For me, that's a team, one of them is searching for their identity. They're searching for their best 11. And the other one obviously knows who they are, all right? And I think that we saw that in this match. Statistically, if you do a breakdown, there's not much in it. 47% possession for Senegal, 53 for Cameroon. Five shots for Senegal, six for Cameroon. Eight corners for Senegal, nine for Cameroon. But if you look at the XG, for example, 1.23 for Senegal, 0 0.43 for Cameroon. And I think this is one of those matches that you had to watch. And if you watched it, there was a quite clear eye test. Anybody watching the match knew that Senegal was going to win this match. They knew that Senegal were the better team and that Cameroon really, really, really struggled to create anything of value. The main difference for me is the quality in midfield and across the front line. Senegal uh, are coming in with two very young midfielders in Pat Matarsar and uh, Lamin Kamara, who was man of the match in the first match. And then even Pap Gaze is a young midfielder, as a defensive midfielder. In the preview, I thought, you know, can you really rely on the youngsters? You know, you have the older generation with Drisa Ganagay, who is, you know, Sheikhu Kouyate. Those are your former midfielders. And you bring in, you know, a 19-year-old and, I don't know, like a 21-year-old. Can you rely on them to, to really come up against some of the heavyweights like Cameroon uh, and play well? And they did. And they showed quality. And they showed drive through midfield. And they showed that they could carry the ball. And they could be creative. Whereas Cameroon in midfield? Sheesh. I mean, I, I tweeted, you know, during the match. Um, I, I took a look at Cameroon's midfield players over the last few AFCONs. You are uh, <laughs> an audience that follows African football, so you might know some of these names, but I think many, many normal, you know, universal football fans wouldn't. Sebastian Siani, Arnaud Jum, Georges Monjac, Pierre Koundé, Martin Angla, Samuel Umgue, sorry, Samuel Umgue, Olivier Encham, Olivier Kamen. Obviously, you have like players like Ivan Neyu as well. You have players like Andre Frank Zambongisa, but those ones that I listed off, I don't want to say they're copy-paste, <laughs> the same mold of midfielder, but they're physical midfielders. They're very, very rarely play passes forward or through the lines. Um, they're not really box-to-box. -box. They're kind of static. Um, some some, some <laughs> people on Twitter call them bodyguards instead of footballers. And it really is, you know, like the, the stereotypical mold of midfielder that uh, people think of when they think of Cameroon. Gone are the days, uh, you know, when you had more creative Cameroonian uh, midfielders. Uh, and then in the 1980s, you had somebody like Teofila Bega, even somebody like Ashil Imana, you know, used to be much more creative and used to play incisive uh, through balls and, and things like that. Cameroon in midfield haven't been good for many, many years. But they compensated for that in 2017 and 2021. How did they compensate for that? Well, they compensated by having a really good front line. So in 2017, Christian Basagog had the tournament of his of his life, and he was obviously the golden ball in that tournament. Uh, you know, you had Mukanjo, the captain, who, who was great at set pieces and that could score goals. Uh, Vincent Abubakar came in late in that tournament, but, you know, he provided a lot of quality. And then in 2021, that front line of Mumin Gamale, Karl Tokwakambi on the other side, 
and Vincent Abubakar. They were absolutely fantastic. Abubakar had eight goals. Carl Toko Kambi had five, 13 between them. And Momi Angamalo was providing a lot of the service. And this AFCON, you've been playing Josh Kevin and Kudu, who's been in okay form. You've been playing Franck Magri out of position. Carl Toko Kambi out of position as a target man. Uh, it's like, ah, you know? Mumi and Gamalu came in. It's not the same kind of quality, and they can't rely on that quality across the front line. And that's been the major... So, so they've had the midfield problem for years, but they've compensated with a really good front line. And in this tournament, they don't even have a great front line, and a lot of the players are being played out of position. So uh, let's talk about that difference in midfield. <laughs> like, um, Well, actually, let's start with, first of all, there, there's other cultural problems with Cameroon. Andre Onana, we all know the story. Um, First of all, he's excluded from the World Cup side, yeah, for apparently wanting to play the ball with his feet. Rigobert Song says that's not how you do it. There's a back and forth, some talking back, and he's excluded from the group for discipline. Okay, um, he signs for Manchester United over the summer, and now everybody wants Andre Nana back. But when he signed for Manchester United, they were under the impression that he wasn't going to go and play in the African Cup of Nations. And now you want him for the African Cup of Nations, and he has to compromise and negotiate with Manchester United to even come and play at this tournament. So as a result, he misses the first game. And some people understand this decision. I think the vast majority of people don't. They said, you know, you should have just been strong with Manchester United. You should have told them, we don't care. We're coming to this tournament. We're going to be, uh, you know, it's, it's the country that's calling me up. You know, I can't say no. I have to be here on time. When Anna comes, he's, uh, he concedes his 48, 49th, 50th, and 50th, 51st goal of the season uh, <laughs> in this match. Um, and the first goal is a corner kick. He comes out to punch the ball. He doesn't make good contact. It's not a horrific mistake, but it's he should have done better. And Ismail, uh, Pat Matarsar comes in with a crunching duel, wins it, gets the ball to Ismail Asar, who uh, does a great job of really uh, pivoting really quickly and slotting the ball home, kind of similar to what Mohamed Mustafa did in, in their first match against Mozambique. Take a look at Senegal's second goal. When's the last time we've seen Cameroon score a goal like that? Sadio Mane cutting and dribbling, playing to Ismail Assar. He's d daring defenders to come in for a tackle. Okay, it doesn't work out. Comes back around, gets the ball to Crepin Diata. Crepin Diata has a right back. Dribbles <laughs> again through like two or three Cameroonian defenders. They start playing wonderful one-two play. Uh, Pap Matarsar gets in on it. Or sorry, Lamin Kamara gets in on it again. Uh, Ismail Assar is on, on it. And eventually the ball finds itself to Habib Diallo, uh, who slides and, and, and gets contact on Ismail Asar's low cross, and they score a second goal. When is the last time we've seen Cameroon score a goal like that? I, I don't remember them. Honestly, I don't. Cameroon pull a, a, goal, a goal back, and they only really had control of this match in the final 10 minutes, you know? And how do they score? They score through a set piece and a, or a cross. And it was the exact same thing in the first match against Guinea. They scored, George Kevin and Kudu cut in, he played a cross, Magri scores a header. This time, uh, Olivier Cham plays a short corner, cross, Jean-Charles Castelletto gets his head on it. it seems to be, that seems to be their only plan of attack. They are the side that crosses the ball the most in the African Cup of Nations. Um, is it a viable plan of attack? I, I think it's very predictable. And because it's so predictable, teams can set up for this and it's never going to do anything. You know, It's never going to win you a match against another African heavyweight. Uh, and then finally, they concede a really bad goal at the end. It's a long ball, you know, so Nicholas Jackson does a great job of, you know, controlling, holding off a defender. I think it was Christopher Wu, if I'm not mistaken, plays Idrissa Ganagay in, finds Sadio Mane one time. Again, Andre Onana maybe could have done better, but it wasn't a horrific mistake at the same time. And so Cameroon, I, I think let's, it's, we've seen them for two matches now, and I think it's time to make an overall assessment. Cameroon have two problems. They have a Cameroon problem and they have a Song Eto problem. The Cameroonian problem is the one I cited before. They're not producing creative midfielders. That's a problem because, you know, this is modern football. You need ball-progressing midfielders. You need creative midfielders, uh, especially, you know, when teams are uh, either sitting back in a low block or, you know, pressing you. And Cameroon just don't have that. The Song Eto problem for me is a much bigger problem. Samuel Eto comes in and he's the president of FECA Foot. Uh, just before the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations, of course, in 2022. 
There are rumors, credible rumors, that Samuel Eto'o took the job because he was struggling financially and he apparently thought that that was one way that he could do it. Um, let's put that aside. Okay, let's say Samuel Eto'o is 100% invested and he wants the, the betterment of Cameroonian football. First of all, he's made like three or four horrific mistakes so far. Things as you know, simple as signing a personal deal with one ex-bet and then them signing with the you know the the local domestic league a few weeks later or, or a, li a little bit later that's an obvious conflict of interest in qatar of course he was ha harassed by an algerian supporter or not even a supporter i don't know what we can call him like a youtuber or something like that and uh he shows i i understand you, i understand how annoying that is i understand that you want to hit the youtuber but you can't you're the president of fekafoot and he kicks the the youtuber and he apologizes after but for me, the biggest problem that he, or the, the worst mistake that he made, is he goes from Tony Concesao, the former coach at the 2021 African Cup of Nations, an African Cup of Nations where you only lost to Egypt in penalties. You have, you're quite, I think, probably the side that plays the best football in the tournament. You have, you know, everything is clicking, and you fire him. Why would you fire him after a third place finish at home? I know he didn't win the trophy, but. Everything was clicking. He was playing the best players in their positions, unlike Rigo Bersong. And he replaces him with Rigo Bersong. Why did he replace him with Rigo Bersong? Again, you ask, you know, Cameroonians, many people say that Rigo Bersong, first of all, is a very influential and respected personality in their country, which again is very understandable considering the career that he had. But Rigo Bersong also supported Samuel Eto'o in the Fekafut elections. And as a result, it's kind of like a scratch my back, scratch yours. And of course, they know each other as friends. And so Set Rigo Bersang becomes the coach, despite him having no real good track record of being a good coach. Rigo Bersang um, was coaching the Olympic team prior. He'd never had great results. Okay. He qualifies Cameroon to the World Cup with, again, a cross. <laughs> two crosses in Algeria. They win 2-1 in, in the final kick of the game. And they, they score on two either set pieces or crosses. And it really papers over the cracks because... Uh, they had, pre had lost 1-0 at home prior to winning 2-1 away from home. And that match where they lost 1-0 at home was the first time that Cameroon lost away from home in a very, very long time, in decades. So this paper's over the crack. They have a horrific World Cup. Not sh absolutely shambolic, but subpar. And then their qualifying uh, campaign you know, goes down to the last day, and they really struggle with teams like you know Namibia, again, who showed that they're not, they're no pushovers, but you expect Cameroon to win those matches. And so we have we're in a position now where we have you know uh, Samuel Eto'o the the honeymoon period is over a lot of the promises that he made about you know professionalizing the league and about you know uplifting Cameroonian football it's been a couple of years now and we still haven't seen those results he makes a bad coaching hire he has those other mistakes that I I just spoke about now what now you have one point after two match days and your backs are completely against the wall. And if Cameroon fails to make it out of the group stages, Rigo Bersang has to go. And I think many people in Cameroon are starting to think about the Samuel Eto'o have to go as well. Okay, so that's that's really the sad state of affairs that we have for the Cameroonian uh, national team. Um, not saying they can't turn it around, but <laughs> it doesn't look like they're going to turn it around. And I can't see how they're going to turn it around. Senegal, on the other hand, you know, hats off. They look like one of the two or three best teams in this tournament. They look like serious pretenders to, uh, or contenders, I should say, uh, to um, repeat, which would be, you know, iconic. We've only had, ever had a handful of teams repeat in the African Cup of Nations. Last team to do it, of course, was in Egypt, 2000, when they three-peated, actually, 06, 08, and 10. Um, and they, <laughs> it's a cliche, but they do have that perfect mix of young players and experienced players they seem to be united and they showed today that you know they're definitely there to take the trophy let's talk about the other two matches briefly Cape Verde versus Mozambique uh, the first match of the day first of all I was here in Abidjan I was supposed to go to Amsukro but travel issues um, it was sweltering and it wasn't like the sun you know like hitting you on the head and like you're feeling like oh my god i need some shade it was just stifling humidity it's humidity that like dehydrates you and at the same time you can't breathe and you can't you know fill your lungs with air and um as a result i think you know we didn't see cape Verde dominate as they did in the ghana match i think this was much more of an even fixture despite the scoreline um 
we just saw Cape Verde score some pretty crazy goals. Bebe, uh, one free kick hits the crossbar. The next free kick goes in despite the goalkeeping error. Let's let's not mention that. I remember watching him against Ghana, and he he lined up a shot from like thirty five yards out, and uh, he hit it. You know, with that he's trying to get that top spin on the ball like he did today with those two free kicks, and it went wide, and everybody's like laughing at him. Oh, that was ambitious, wasn't it? And I thought to myself, you know, if he makes good contact on that, he's confident enough to try that technique. And today he did it, and, and it worked on two free kicks, and he scored from one of them. Um, otherwise, I was very, very impressed with, you know, Cape Verde's front six, from Deroy Duarte to uh, Pina uh, in defensive midfield to Jamiro Montero, uh, Giovale Cabral uh, on the left wing, and Bebe, and on the right wing, Ryan Mendez. And, and that front three, they do a great job of, you know, switching sides you'll have Bebe come out on the wing you'll have Cabral go up as a, as a target man Ryan Mendez also rotates um, and, and you see that they it, it's weird because when you look at it like a lot of them only have you know less than 10 caps for Cape Verde but it seems like they've been playing together for years and I think as a, a, a the coach Bubista deserves a lot of uh, credit for, for that definitely um, so Cape Verde's front six Hats off to them, and they look honestly like one of the best teams in the tournament as well. I don't know if they can carry that on for for much longer because I don't know. We haven't seen them do this for a lo- an extended period of time, but at the moment they're they're very very hot, and I don't think anybody's looking forward to playing against them. Mozambique had a pretty poor goalkeeping error that we just touched on. They had a very bad defensive error uh, for the second goal, um, and that Ryan Mendes scored, and and the third goal that Pina scored I think was unsavable, but Jenny Katamu. He was missing in the first match against Egypt, but he showed you that he is one of the most exciting young talents in Africa. The way he can dribble, the way he can strike the ball, he's so, so good. And I think it was unfortunate that he missed the first match, but it's great that he's being exposed to the wider African public here. So Cape Verde are through with six points. Uh, The first team to automatically go through. Uh, They're going to win the group. Nobody else can catch them. And uh, it's going to be great to see how they do in the knockout stages. Finally, we had a little bit more of a boring match between Guinea and, and the Gambia. I think, you know, as journalists or as pundits or analysts, we maybe sort of overrated the Gambia because in the previous tournament, they finished sixth. Um, I, go Coming into this one, I wasn't as confident. I know we didn't do a, a, the Gambia preview, um, but I wasn't as confident. I thought, you know, this was more of like, a, it was more of like a one-time thing than, than them actually repeating. Um, Guinea outplayed the Gambia, I thought, throughout vast majority of this match. It's not like they were creating a crazy amount of chances, but I thought they were always the more likely side to score. Um, and Guinea are still not full strength. So Amadou Diawara was suspended. Nabi Keita came off the bench. He's, you know, recovering from injury. Um, even, of course, Siro Girassi, probably the hottest player in African football um, at the start of this season. He's been out for the first two matches with injury. So uh, the coach Kaba Diawara spoke about, you know, at one on one hand, rewarding the players that came away with a nil, a one one draw against Cameroon in the first match day of the of this uh, of this group stage, and at the same time trying to reintegrate some of these players who are leaders uh, in the team, and I think they they've yet to find that balance. And so I'm gonna you know cut them some slack that they weren't creating so many chances and they didn't dominate so much. But I was really really impressed with their right side. So you had the a 20 year old right back named Ibrahim Diakite, who I thought you know was probably the best player in the first half, and then you have Morgan Gilavogi, the right winger who was probably the best player of the second half. And they created a lot of havoc for the Gambia on that wing, and, and the Gambia struggled to, to contend with that. They created very little, the Gambia, and the Scorpions, I fear, I fear, uh, are probably, they have zero points, yeah? They're probably going home now. Um, and yeah, that's it. That's uh, AFCON Diary Day 7. Those are my observations. I hope you enjoyed them. Uh, so far, people have been giving me really good feedback for this uh, AFCON diary. I'm just going to finish it with one final bit of news. Tanzania's coach, uh, Algerian coach, Adel Amrush, has been fired by the Tanzanian Football Federation. He had made comments to Algerian television about the ma- before, prior to the match against Morocco, a match in which they lost 3-0. Uh, he had said that, you know, um, Morocco are a side with a lot of influence within the Confederation of African Football, and he brought up the example of them... Um, him wanting to play at a certain time during the day, you know, when it's hot. Um, and this was in uh, the previous FIFA window, and that Morocco, uh, apparently through their influence, um, they got to pick the time at which they played, Morocco and Tanzania. And also he was even talking about the referees and how they pick which referees, um, you know, officiate their matches. So he goes through the discipline committee. I thought eight games was harsh, to be honest. Eight games for for 
for that. I do think he deserves to be suspended. That's my unbiased objective point of view. And I think if he was going to be suspended and it, and it was going to be even two, three matches, which is probably going to be beyond the scope of this AFCON for Tanzania, then they were going to fire him anyway. So uh, Tanzania, something to keep an eye on. Play against Zambia tomorrow. Tomorrow? I believe tomorrow. Maybe after tomorrow. After tomorrow. And uh, they're going to be uh, coached by their interim coach, Hamed Morocco. And he's going to go up against Avram Grant. So it's going to be interesting to see. if that get, Sometimes that can galvanize a group, you know. And other times it can completely dismantle them. So <laughs> that's something to keep an eye on. So that's it. We've been gone for 20 minutes now. So uh, I'm going to bring this AFCON diary to a close. Uh, hope you're enjoying these matches as much as I am. We've had so many goals in the African Cup of Nations. And I can't wait to see how the rest of them are going to unfold. Take care. Good evening from Abidjan. Speak to you soon.